Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. In the fifth grade, my brother and I were sent on a yellow school bus to see a performance at the Shrine Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles of the ever popular, the ever famous, the ever exciting Barber of Seville. Before I go on, let me just say that I do not believe there's anything wrong with the Barber of Seville or opera in general. But in the fifth grade, the obsessions of our youth were the voices of the Jackson Five. Nobody ever asked us where we wanted to go on our field trips. My brother, he echoed my sentiment the day we took our uh, trip slip home to be signed by our parents. Screw Figaro, man. Nevertheless, the night before our big field trip, we spent it singing but one word, Figaro. At the dinner table with mashed potatoes in our mouths, we sang Figaro, 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 right up until our mother got up and shouted, Por favor, ya cañense con esa canción. <laughs> Maybe other kids would have enjoyed such a visit to this grand concert hall, but every Saturday morning, my brother and I would walk down the street to the Shrine Auditorium and play on its steps. Field trips were supposed to be far and interesting. One time we went to Pomona and an animal guy showed us how to hypnotize a chicken. Now that was interesting. <laughs> Why can't we go far, my brother would ask. What's far, I would say. I don't know, far. This isn't far. I was the quiet and shy Alfaro. My brother was the best pal and buddy to all. A combination sports jock, boy most likely to dare ticker, girl kisser, and all around practical joker. I studied and concentrated on winning free Highlander workbooks with my conformity while my brother perfected the art of heavy petting. <laughs> the day of the field trip, little Jose Gonzalez, who lived down the street, started in on us for bringing burrito lunches to the field trip. He laughed and screamed, hey, where'd you get your lunches, Tijuana? I held my brother back and begged him not to speak the unspeakable. You see, Mrs. Gonzalez, little Jose's mother, got taken away on a Saturday morning when in a crazed rage she ran down the street naked and crying and asking to speak to the President of the United States. After that, nobody ever mentioned Mrs. Gonzalez again, as if she had never existed, as if she had never baked Explorer Scout cupcakes or went to PTA meetings or read at Sunday Mass or helped with the Stations of the Cross. Never again did we hear about Mrs. Gonzalez. Like broken fingers and stillborn babies, you kind of just forgot about her. Except to my brother, of course. It seems that he never forgot Mrs. Gonzalez because he was always looking for the opportunity to mention it to little Jose. Our teacher, Mrs. Polka, notices our fifth grade conflict in her black miniskirt, her wide knee-high boots. She checks her lipstick in a very sexy, non-threatening Angelina Jolie sort of way, and she always coos. <gasps> Inside the Shrine Auditorium, there seem to be thousands of children from unified school districts throughout the universe. They shriek and they scream as they test the theater's echo system. Backstage, I imagine uptight little opera singers with big voices muttering the wings. Oh, shit. As we file into our row, my brother and I lead the class to our seats, which is, I guess, one of the pleasures of being an A for Alfaro. But a nervous tin sweeps over me when I notice that row two, directly behind us, is being led by little Jose, a G for Gonzalez. He sits directly behind us with a wicked smile on his face. The lights in the auditorium begin to fade, the fifth grade hush with a few boos and scattered giggles. The lights on the stage brightens, and the opera begins. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. We are not even five minutes into it when little Jose Gonzalez starts to whisper, hey, it smells like burritos in here. <laughs> and then that all time stupid nervous giggle of his, half nostril, half contracted throat, I hate asthma kids. My brother starts to tense up and I start to get nervous. His nostrils begin to flare and he begins to brush back his hair like he always does when he gets angry. Good people of Culver City, it is at these times in my youth that I sought the solace of a higher source. I try to pray a novena without the beads and hope that God will forgive me and intercede. But then it happens, I should have known that it would. In the cavernous darkness of the Shrine Auditorium, my brother and I hear, Hey, how does your fat mom squeeze into the kitchen and make burritos anyway? It is, uh, it is followed by an even more strained asthma giggle. It is asked with such a cruelty, it 
feel it pierce my heart. It comes at you with such speed and lack of warning, a, a getting caught shoplifting sort of feeling, if any of you in this room can relate. <laughs> I couldn't hide the expression of hurt at that moment. I learned many things. I learned that there is no heaven. I learned that my brother tries and that his good nature fails him. I learned that bad people early on win more than they lose. I learned that our lives will never be the same. I learned that I alter boy for nothing. I know that God doesn't hear very well. And I learned that things are what they are because it was true. We did have a fat mom. A big thighed mother that waddled around the house and smothered us with so much affection that we loved her exactly the way she was. A mom that tried all the diets and laughed them off as we sat in the car at Foster Freeze eating chocolate sundaes. A mom that I always felt I could sink into. And then the beginning of the end is near. I can tell by my brother's hand as it makes its way towards his hairline. Then I hear my brother's voice as clearly as if I had heard God's voice in the heavens. Hey, I'd rather have a fat mom than a crazy naked one any day. <laughs> my heart does a very fast cucaracha dance. I look behind me and I see it register on the face of little Jose Gonzalez, a look that should be added to the Seven Faces of Death video. Tears roll down his cheeks and the sadness of a million summers ending rolls over me. I remember an article in one of my many Highlander workbooks, why is there meanness? I remind myself to never pray again, Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. A squash, breathless scream escapes from little Jose's mouth and he jumps on my brother's back. A few children shout, yelling in high-pitched voices. My brother rises from his seat, and he begins to beat the holy crap out of little Jose Gonzalez. The orchestra rises to a crescendo. Children panic and start to run for the aisles. A collective chorus of cheers and whistles grows to piercing screams that echo off the walls. Figaro! A chaos breaks out in row number five, our row. Party lines are drawn. Some boys join in with the Alfaro camp. Some boys join in with the Jose Gonzalez camp. Opera-loving little girls begin to cry and run down the aisle. And I look towards the stage, and even the opera people are staring at us. The barber of Seville himself has walked over to the lip of the stage to see what is going on. I look to my left. And I see the dreaded blackened miniskirt and the wide knee-high boots racing towards us. I lean into my brother and I beg him to stop. And I look into his face and I see that he is, he's smiling. He's smiling. How can he be smiling? I think that my brother likes this. In fact, I can see that he isn't enjoying himself very much. I have never seen him so passionate. This is what he has lived for. He's obviously peaking early in his life, but this is that one event that my brother has been waiting for all of his 11 years. My brother is having a moment. <laughs> Mrs. Polka reaches over me and I see her bright red painted nails dig into my brother's arm. He screams but continues to punch the little Jose Gonzalez camp. And then I see her scream and scratch my brother's arm again and I yell. She digs in again and this time she strikes gold when the blood starts to drip down my brother's skin. And the world of my brother, Jaime Alfaro Jr., ended as quickly as it had begun. My brother's arm comes up off of little Jose Gonzalez. It stretches to an open palm, and it lands almost perfectly on Mrs. Polka's face. <laughs> there is a loud, audible gasp. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> For a moment, it seems that the world has stopped. One big... Uh-oh, echoes the cavernous auditorium. Mrs. Polka is stunned and unable to move. She has become a Yosemite deer in headlights. I face my brother just in time to watch him end his aria with a finale so inspired that I shiver. He arches up his 11-year-old body as far as it will go. He purses his cheeks and dead aims a wad of spit that hits Mrs. Polka right in the eye. A thousand school children cheer and scream. <laughs> I stagger towards my seat, dazed and embarrassed at the spectacle I have just witnessed. It is opera at its finest, no doubt, and I am moved to do what any opera lover would do. I break out into tears. I sit in row five, and I just start to cry. I cry for the lack of a heaven. I cry for the feeling that I'll never be a boy again. I even cry that Santa is fake, even though I've known that for years. I watch my brother being dragged down the long shrine auditorium aisle, and I stop, and I think that maybe he gave a great performance to the peons of the Los Angeles Unified School District. 
As he is being led away by a couple of principals and a mini-skirted fifth grade teacher with spit on her face, he is kicking and screaming and llorando and laughing like I had never seen him laugh and cry before. And I know, I know that I have seen the performance of a lifetime. In the world of life called fifth grade, this was definitely an opera to equal the Barber of Seville. 